It's time for Talking Pints, and tonight's guest is somebody who, I've got to tell you, I have shared a few pints with before in various Westminster establishments. His name is Paul Staines. Paul, welcome to Good Talking to Pints. Good to see you. Now, Paul Staines, but actually, it's Guido Fawkes, isn't it? Well, that's what we're known for. But that's uh, what you're known for. I mean, you are Paul Staines yeah. in reality. I answered both names, but I, I tried to keep it a separate identity to myself. You know, but a lot of people do call me by Guido. And... Now, we have a tradition in this country going back centuries. And I think we do it, I think we do it better than almost anybody else. We were, in the 18th century, cartooning people, lampooning people, sending messages through cartoons, through writings. We've had, you know, all sorts of radio, TV programmes, private eyes been going 60 years. We do satire... We do gossip, don't we, incredibly well? Yeah, I think all the pamphleteers of old, the 18th yeah. century pamphleteers in the city coffee shops were spreading gossip and rumour. Hopefully some of it true, some of it scandalous. <laughs> but it had a market, and uh, that's what I found out very quickly. I mean, I started in 2004. Yeah. What was, what was the inspiration that made you launch this site? OK, so I had been working in fund management, uh, started out in the city, and uh, had a career that was great fun and profitable. And then I got into litig litigation with my uh, backer for two years. And whilst I was twiddling my thumbs, I thought I'd have a go at this blogging thing, which... Uh, uh, I'd... And the internet was still relatively new. Yeah, I mean, Facebook hadn't happened yet. Twitter was four years away at that time. So it all preceded that. I didn't know how to do it, but somebody I knew said, oh, you just go on here, get this bit of software. I had to go. And for the first... You know, a few months, it was just probably the only people reading it were me and a couple of mm -hmm. my friends. And then it slowly grew, and by about 2005, we had a front-page story that hit all the 2005 election, Michael Howard versus uh, um, the machine of lay New Labour at that time. And I had a story that uh, was picked up by the Evening Standard and hit all the front pages. And then, as you get more and more scoops, the audience grows. Until now, you know, we measure our... Traffic in millions. I mean, we have a bigger traffic than a lot of political magazines. I think the new states would kill to have our audience. No, I mean, Guido Fawkes is a very well-established, very successful site. 18 years is a long time. To no, it is. And, and as somebody that's been written about in it <laughs> more, more than once, you know, sometimes you like what you guys write, other times you don't like it, but that's the rough with the smooth. A lot of professional politicians take it quite well. And sometimes I go to a party and I forget... I don't know, someone's giving me dagger eyes, and I haven't written the story. One of the staff, one of our reporters has written the story. And what have we done? And I have to sort of Google my own site to find out what we've done to this person that makes them so angry. Are you a gossip site or a news site? Well, today's gossip is often tomorrow's news. Um, and things that are rumours do turn out to be factual sometimes. in the end. Come on, well, so sometimes. Look, we are, as I explained to Lord Leveson... Uh, We're going to come uh, to Leveson that. Inquiry, the... The, if you go to Reuters and they're talking about where the interest rates have just gone up, that's a big uh, news story, has to be checked out ten different ways. If we're talking about whether someone has got drunk in a bar, uh, we're going to go with maybe one source. If it's career ending, I'm going to want to stand it up very carefully. But, you know, rumours are rumours, and we're never wrong for long. Well, uh, you say that, but, you know, if you're not absolutely certain of the veracity of a story, you'll write it in such a way that you're not going to be subject to legal action. I mean, yes. let's be honest about it. Yes, and I've gone to a lot of trouble to protect myself from litigation. So I based the servers in the United States, yes. the First Amendment protections, and I, uh, I, I live in Ireland. You know, that, that's... If but, you, but you still have to be responsible in what you put out. Yeah, I mean, we do sometimes get taken to court, you yeah. know, by rich people, usually. Uh, I... I haven't collected any writs this year, I don't think. First time, I can remember. For well, you time. must be getting old. You, 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 you're losing your touch. <laughs> maybe, <I mean. laughs> maybe. We have been going downhill since 2004, I think. Um, but we occasionally do. And, look, we do have a corrections policy, and we do want to get it right. Now, you might not like our interpretation of events, which is more of our opinion about And that's something. more political. Yeah. So that's the views Because, I mean, you news. yourself, you yourself, you know, you were a member of the Federation of Conservative I Students, was. which was so right-wing that Norman... I think, I think John Burko was in it back yeah, in those that's, days. I've known John Burko for a lo very long time. Yeah. And, and the longer and you know, the less you like him. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone goes on about how I was in uh, Lord Tebbit closed it down. It was too right-wing. It's true, it's true, but 
couple of years later, I was in the SDP. So I wasn't, you know, I, I'm of the right. You know, I like to think of centre rights. So I'm always a bit bemused when people think just because I like free enterprise and low taxes that, you know, I've got leather uh, suits in, in, the, in the drawer. So, no, I'm kind of, I don't see us as uh, that far out from the mainstream. Brexiteer? Yes, we, were, we lent into Brexit very hard. As you Which know. was very tough in Westminster. It was, but it was, there was, all my friends, you know, uh, were of that ilk. We, I think our editorial line in those days, I remember going to the Sun editor and the, when they were giving us a column and they, they were less warm in those days towards Brexit, I think. And um, I said, look, we're somewhere between UKIP and the Tories in our editorial line. And she said, said, oh, that's where we are. You know, so, <laughs> so she never interfered with our column. We did the column there happily for three years. And you were a Trump doubter? I was a Trump doubter, and you're going to remind everyone. Oh, ah, no, I forgot. I've completely that was. forgotten the bet we had. So <laughs> let, let me just uh, uh, cut to tell the story because you'll enjoy it too much. <laughs> so I, I, I think I gave you odds. You did. I gave you odds. And then when Trump got elected, I gave you a £10,000 check. Oh, you did. You did. Yeah. I won 10 grand off him. That's quite a big bet for Damn. me. Damn. I think my wife might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I did buy you lunch, though. Yeah, you let me choose the wine, which is very fair. Which was uh, pretty fair. No, that, 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 was a, that was a good win for me. <laughs> Today, explain to people who've never been involved in journalism, they care about politics and they, you know, want to hear about the people that run the country and the good things about them and the bad things about them. How does a Westminster news site, gossip site. How do you get your stories? Well, one of the greatest investigative tools in journalism is alcohol. And it loosens lips quite a lot. So there are bars in Westminster, and I don't tend to be in there. In fact, I don't have a pass to go on the parliamentary estate. Um, but the reporters work for me. They're around there. They can see them propping up bars, buying people drinks, chatting. They're in the milieu. Um, a lot of the stories and the way Westminster works these days are that SPAD class, the special advisor yeah, class. Yeah. And they are usually smart boys and girls, 25 to 35, on the first rung in politics. And it's become a fast track ever since, well, probably since Cameron and Osborne went from special advisor to running the country in, well, just over a decade. Mm. So a lot of very bright people are in that world. And we mix with them. We increasingly mix with the uh, opposition political advisors. They're known as pads in the trade. Um, and and that's, that's a resource. I, I'm old enough and I've been around long enough now that you know, I do talk to cabinet ministers and you know, I've seen six prime ministers. So to my surprise, I'm on first name terms with them, but I don't often text and them. And people also ring you with stories. People do ring me with stories. And quite often, and we have, a, we have a phone line, which a lot of uh, websites don't. You can call up and tell us something. And people often call up and say, you probably know this already, but I heard da 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 And that's usually a great story. Yeah. And it's often most junior people who have been spoken down to or kicked downwards who give you the best stories. Now, I'm somebody who was, uh, for a few years, pretty much hated by most of the British media because I stood up against the political class. I had a point of view that wasn't popular. And my goodness me, you know, I know what it's like when the full wrath of the press. I mean, you know, for many years, not a single national newspaper supported me in any way at all. And I saw the Leveson inquiry, Hoving interview, and you gave testimony there, didn't you? I did. You see, I think, and it's interesting, I mean, I personally think that Leveson has made life for public figures more livable, more acceptable a bit less fearful for their families. But we had a former Sunday Red Top editor sitting in your chair a few weeks ago who said, Nigel, that building over there, we don't get any sex scandals anymore. We don't get anything like the financial scandals we used to get. Do you think it's not happening anymore? Where do you fall on the way Leveson? Well, it's, 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 uh, I think... So my view about character of politicians is important and that if they are... You know, the old-fashioned view, they're lying to their wives, they're more likely to lie to the voters. Now, that might be uh, an unfortunate truth, but I think it is a truth. So when people are presenting themselves in one way and they're acting another, I think that's interesting. Nowadays, you have to have... It's tough to publish that stuff now. Nowadays, because of Leveson, and the newspapers are reluctant to do it, and MPs go to law quite quickly nowadays, mm. you have to have often a security angle 
or has to be irrelevant to um, the public interest. Public interest. So, for instance, um, I hate to bring his name up, but there was an MP sending out nude pictures. Uh, that was the last one of those type of stories I think we did. Mm, I remember. But he was a minister of the crown, and he was a, he was a, a security risk if he's sending out naked pictures to people he'd only met online. So yeah, that kind of story still happens. Okay, is the balance right? Has Leveson got the balance for public figures, whether they're politicians or footballers? And the I think, press, I think it's, have we got it right? I think it's good that um, the families' children are yeah. protected to yeah. some extent. I mean, because before it was becoming a free for all. Yeah, no, I think that's that's fair enough. But if you choose to go into public life, and I include the Beckhams in this, by the way, if you choose to go into public life, it is part and parcel. You don't deserve all the abuse you get on Twitter, uh, but that is the way the world is. Mm. If mm. you choose to go into public life, then you should expect public scrutiny. No, I get that. It's about the balance. Now, over the years, the big stories that you've broken, you know, the Gordon Brown stories, what are the, what are the highlights Guido Fawkes. Highlights of your career in terms of stories that you've broken and the effect they've had. When I always forget the stories when I'm asked these ones. I think that Damien McBride trying to organise smears, smear gates as it was called, yep. was probably one of the most consequential stories. Uh, we had the Prime Minister's advisor had to resign. Gordon Brown was shown to be you know, devious and willing to employ you know, a pretty unsavoury henchman. And I remember a call coming from... Um, uh, a special advisor to George Osborne calling up and saying, you've moved, the, you've moved the polls five points in a week. Because, you know, Gordon Brown's moral compass was out the window. And it just showed the public that it was, no, it was the time when the Tories first broke through 40 points on the yeah. polls. Yeah. So that was pretty consequential. I think a lot of the public service stuff we've done on uh, MPs' expenses on those fiddles, uh, people went to jail, deservedly so, you mm. know. Uh, that kind of stuff. And we've started to do more um, corruption stories and hypocrisy stories in uh, the media. We're actually now turning the spotlight on the media, and they do not like that. The thinnest-skinned people are journalists. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I've seen that. And through, through the Paul Staines, Guido Fawkes stable, you've trained all these youngsters and sent them out, and you've got the political editor of the Sun newspaper and people in number 10 Downing Street. and That must fill you with a certain sense of satisfaction. It's good to see. They were all talented people. I mean, yeah. I was lucky to have them. You know, Harry Cole worked for me for six years. It's annoying because he thinks like me and he's got all my contacts <laughs> and he's just more charming than I am. <laughs> so he's, he's done a really good job. He's obviously one of the most powerful positions in political journalism. But, you know, there's Juliet... Samuels at the Telegraph, yep, very, very strong columnist. Great writer. Uh, there's a lot of special advisors in government who thought that their career would be ruined working for me and they'd never get into government. But <laughs> it's, it shows how poachers can become gamekeepers and vice versa no, quite easily. And 12 years, 12 years of Conservative government, they're going into opposition, aren't they? I can't recall a government or a uh, leadership doing this badly going on to win. There are no rules in politics, though, as Tony Blair said. But I think the public is formed a view, and it will be very difficult, even if they get the growth. And I have a hunch that with tax cuts, if they push them through, they will get the growth. But no incumbent government during a period of high inflation is forgiven uh, by the electorate. It doesn't matter if it's left yeah. or right. High inflation eras see changes of government. Paul Staines, keep doing what you do. Thank you. And thank you for joining me on Talking Pads. Cheers. OK, it's time for Barrage the Farage. What do we have this evening? Trevor asks, has Truss signed the UK into the EU army without parliamentary debate? There'll be no debate at all. And, you know, when we say EU army, well, of course, it's PESCO. It's cooperation. Uh, Gerald Howarth was unsure earlier on tonight exactly what she'd signed up to. Ben Habib thought we'd gone the whole way. We don't quite know the truth of what she signed up to. Paul, is, is trust going soft, soft on Europe? or I think she's making friends in Europe and trying to be a bit more conciliatory towards them. I don't think we need anything beyond NATO. NATO's worked well, for I couldn't agree 50 more. years. I couldn't agree 70 years. 70, sorry. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it, this is the EU itself, wanted to be a global superpower in its own blooming right. Robbo asks, 
The women's Irish football team sang IRA songs after beating Scotland. What does that tell us about the UK? Well, Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom, so I'm not quite sure I see the relevance of that. And generally, what I would say is that relations between Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and the United Kingdom are a damn sight better now than they were 25 years ago. You live in Ireland. Well, I think something I've noticed of late is everybody under 30 seems like they're going to vote for Sinn Féin. Mm. So I don't think those girls, they're all quite young, I don't think they really realised what... The, and they've apologised, by the way. They didn't really realise just how... It was a charm. Yeah. 